Howdy. All I right. just turned everything off and back on. I guess it was my fault. It's cool. We just decided to do exactly what we always do, which is just roll. Just roll. Them. <laughs> just yeah. roll them. So take, you know, take two. Grumpy scientists, a little bit more grumpy, a little bit later than they wanted to be eight minutes late. Yeah. So, but of course, as it, Murphy's Law always works because everything goes wrong. I think the minute our, uh, our, our technical support team stepped out of the room and then he had to run back. <laughs> but I think, well, unless we start hearing more feedback here, I think we're, we're basically pretty good. Yeah, I um, think so. So we were going to ask some uh, for some some people to just give us questions and we'd be happy to give them answers. So um, are we uh, we're ready to go at this point. Right. So we can just go ahead and how, how do you want to do this? As you can see, we haven't practiced this. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the moderator was going to get questions and he was going to text them to us. So whenever they type them in on YouTube or whatever, however it's set up, then uh, okay. since we're not really on YouTube, we're just streaming to YouTube. So there's 30 second delay. So we got 30 seconds to kill whatever we say, apparently. Right, right exactly. <laughs> um, I think Eric can kill it if one of us drops an accidental F bomb. I'm pretty good about not doing that, I think. Yeah, but, we've been pretty good about that. And I guess one thing I, I do recall, we, we've we only killed like two videos. And most of those were, you know, where, where Bob got a little bit into the power power to the people thing and got a little bit on a, on a long rant. So we had to shorten it. But uh, <laughs> um, uh huh. I'm just uh, will you send? Yeah, here we go. We just have to make sure the pipeline is open. So Eric just texted and said, "Well, there's a lot of people saying hi. Well, hello to both of you, both viewers. Yeah. We're happy to have you here. You bet. Uh, okay, so." The, the, some of the main questions that we get relate to magnetic fields and things like that. So I have a sort of a little whiteboard ready. Um, and we can, uh, we can basically, I <laughs> drinking a beer. Oh, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky. I don't have a beer. We haven't gone shopping for a while. I don't have a beer. So I was going to keep the label to myself so nobody would know, but you know, I guess that's kind oh, of, no, that, that's, that doesn't look like a beer. Yeah, no, that one of my, like, one uh, my buddies just said, we can't, we can't talk uh anyway he, he's on vacation he was disappointed i wasn't going to be drinking today so uh oh. you know that's half our viewers i thought i didn't want to disappoint him so uh cheers <laughs> there you go okay well so um we do actually get a lot of questions i spent i spent all morning on our forum answering questions about that people had about different things and it's very often it's the same kind of questions because magnetism does not work like light. And this is, I think, I think I finally understand now why people have such difficulty with this topic. It's because people think that magnets emit energy the same way light does. And it's absolutely not true. I mean, they're both electromagnetism, but it's um, they're the way that electronic, the, that waves of light don't interact versus magnetic fields that always interact. And there's, there's big differences. So I'm going to kind of go into that. Um, we will, uh, you know, answer these questions as they, as they arise. Um, yeah. So why so, do we make up our own stuff until they arrive? Question, like, why the hell are you guys on? Yeah, why are we even doing this? Even uh, prepared well, I don't know. We just thought it'd be something fun to do. We talked somebody into asking questions, and we're too lazy to open up the mailbag and open up the email box. So this way we could do them in real time. Well, the other thing is we get a lot of the same kinds of questions over and over again. And um, um, why don't I just, why don't I just, while we're here, why don't I just go ahead and answer one of the questions that I know we're going to get. Okay. About. Um, about the number of coils. Yeah. Well, it's about magnetic fields. So let me, uh, let me share my screen here. Can everybody see my whiteboard? I hope so. So let me, uh, let me show you how, how, a little bit about how magnetism really works. And um, this is kind of like, uh, let me see here. Yeah, that's about the right size screen. Okay. So let's say that you have, you know, people ask, you know, how big is the magnetic field or, or, or 
how do I, you know, how do I get the maximum magnetic field, which is really not what you want. And uh, we did get a question in the email that basically says, how do the magnetic fields look for different coil configurations? And let me, let me tell you why that's, that's a really difficult question to answer honestly. Um, if you, uh, don't need that guy. If you have a, uh, if you have a flashlight, let's, these are two flashlights. Okay. And I'm going to show you what happens when light interacts on flashlight. Okay. So here's a flashlight. And if we, um, if we look at, um, the rays of light coming out of a flashlight. Try to imagine that I'm able to draw straight lines with a mouse, which is almost impossible. You can imagine that, you know, as, as you see, you know, you get further away from something with a flashlight and the rays get further and further apart. And what you're really looking at is something called the inverse square law. So you've got this um, flashlight, it's, um, I'll, I'll circle it in green and I'll say, you know, if you make a spot that's about as big as the green spot here, right? If you uh, go twice as far away, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger spot. And this, and this is a uh, result of what's known as the inverse square law, right? So you're really talking about... Um, the intensity being related to one over R. And uh, let's see here if I can get this right. One over R squared. Right? So if, you're, if you've got a certain intensity that's one meter away from the light, if you go two meters away, it's going to be two squared, one over four. The area of the circle that you're illuminating is four times as big. And it's got, you know, in any given spot, it's a quarter of the, of the illumination from the light, okay? Interestingly, if you turn on another flashlight, say the light interferes, right? Or it, or it crosses, it doesn't interfere. That's kind of the point. Um, you know, you can open up multiple windows in a bedroom, for example, and you'll see that the light kind of does its own thing from each source, right? The light beams cross, they don't really interact. And you can have as many different light beams in a, in a volume of space as you want. And that's how, how light works, okay? However, magnets are not at all the same way. If you look at a magnet, let's, let's, uh, let's, write our, let's draw ourselves a magnet here. And we'll say that the magnet is um, red. We'll draw it like this. And so the big question here is, you know, you know, how does, how, how do uh, magnetic fields interact? Well, if you just turn one magnet on, its behavior is, is kind of well understood. Okay. It's, it's like this, you, you, um, get a, um, uh, you get a, a magnetic field that closes in on itself. And we'll draw these in blue, say, thin blue lines. So you get a magnetic field that closes on itself. And right about now you're thinking to yourself, come on, Bob, I just want a simple explanation. And this is one of those things like the meaning of life that if you ask me the wrong question, I'm gonna go on and on and on, explain to you why it's a, it's a complicated question because it's a big complex question. Well, the first thing you notice with a magnetic field is it's not like light, all right? It's fundamentally different in a lot of ways. Um, you know, for example, you don't see any straight rays coming out of this, right? You see these curved magnetic fields. And that's because that's the way that magnetism acts. You always have a, you know, with a light, you can have a single point source. You can have a single point, like a like a candle flame, or just a, just a mathematical point, where um, you know this should be. I inadvertently clicked it too soon, but um, this should be uh, symmetric here with another one of these guys. There. So um, yeah, it should be. You should get uh, there. We go. 
That looks about right. So you get uh, these magnetic fields, and they don't they don't radiate out to the edge of the universe like light does. They close in on themselves. Okay, magnetism by convention, magnetic flux lines, magnetic field lines go from north. And they cycle around. They go back into the magnet and south, and they don't behave at all mathematically or physically like light. And this is where everybody gets screwed up because they're thinking, oh, okay, well, I just have to shine a brighter magnetic field on myself and I'll get what I want. Well, that's not really how it works. Um, oops, let me, uh, you know, it, the way that it really works, if you're looking at, if you're looking at uh, a magnet on end, it looks sort of like this. One over R, roughly, cubed, all right? So the magnetic field will drop off if you're looking at it on end, where it's kind of shooting out the end of the magnet. It goes by one over R cubed. But if you're looking at it on its side, the magnetic field is going to look something more like this. One over R. And uh, let's see here. T. It's going to be something a lot more like to the fourth. Okay. So it, instead of being, if you go one meter, it's a certain intensity. You go two meters. Instead of being one quarter, like it would be with light, it's, it's, it's two cubed. So it's one eighth or it's two to the fourth power. So it's one sixteenth. So magnetic fields drop off very much more quickly than light does. That's number one. Okay. The second thing is though, that's quite interesting. If you put um, these two magnets together, what you end up with is the magnetic fields interact with each other and they'll, they'll go in, you know, if they're north to south, the magnetic fields will go into one, out around into the other, and they circle around like this. So what you see is something that looks a heck of a lot more like, um, let's see here, something that looks a heck of a lot more like, uh, like this where the magnetic fields are going in and they're coming around and they're going like this and they go like this, you know? So when you put more than one magnet into the mix, you get this very complex geometry that you do not get with flashlights and light. So the answer to the, the simple question, which is how, you know, you know, how do magnetic fields look when you have, you know, a couple of coils or an array of coil? The answer is you have to run a very complex numerical mathematical simulation. We used to do these when I started in industry in the late 1980s, and they would take 12 hours or something, 12 or 14 hours to calculate all the flux lines. You can calculate on a spreadsheet, you can calculate what light intensity will do, and it will recalculate it in a millionth of a second. But to calculate magnetic flux lines in space, and if you put chunks of, uh, for example, if you have chunks of iron in there, kicking around somewhere, like if you put a chunk of iron in here like this, it would pull these, um, it would pull the flux lines into it. Like, so say we're going to have a big rusty chunk of iron there. The flux lines would get pulled in through it. So there's not something, you know, you can, you can bend the light a little bit. You can bend it with prisms and with lenses, but there's nothing that, that I know of that pulls light from a different location in space and pulls it through and acts as a conduit but magnetic fields find conduits. Magnetic fields are always looking for the least amount of energy to draw a circuit, okay? And that's why they're very, 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 very different from light. And so if you, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you want to, you can calculate it. But here's my, here's my point on this. Say, you know, the other thing is that the, the strength of this magnetic field, which is like how many of these magnetic lines cross through any little tiny spot in space. Okay, that's called a magnetic flux and that relates directly to the magnetic field. Say you know the answer to that. I give you a number, 42, 42 Gauss, I don't know. Um, what is that 43, but no, sure. 40, you know what 42 is from, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hit you up your sky to the galaxy, it's the meaning of the universe, come on, man. Um, okay, so say, say you do know the number, the, the meaning of the universe, the secret number, 42. What does that really tell you? And the answer is that it, it doesn't tell you too much. 
it can be used to check the veracity, the truthfulness of people selling um, magnetic therapy devices. And they'll always try to tell you that they're more powerful than they really are because everybody wants to pay more money for more gauss. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you measured a gauss? I mean, if I sell you a dozen oranges and you want to make sure that you're getting a dozen oranges, what do you do? You count oranges. One, two, three. You can, you can open up the bag and count 12 oranges. But if I say I'm selling you a device that generates a thousand gauss, how do you know? You don't unless you have a magnetic field tester. So I happen to have many of them. And so I've measured and tested and characterized these fields around all kinds of things. And I can tell you, you know, I can tell you about pretty much every device that's sold as a PEMF system on the market misrepresents the number that they generate. Ours, you can test it. It'll come out exactly what I tell you because I, ours is tested and calibrated to a secondary standard that goes to NIST. National Standards Institute of Standards Technology. So ours is exactly what I'm telling you it is. If you use it the way I tell you to use it, it will do exactly what I say it does. And we, it just because it does, it, you know, I'm tested against certified standards. The other people who sell these things, they say, well, somebody's selling 800 gauss. Well, well okay, let's just say it's a, ours is a thousand. So people, you know, people make things up. And when I've actually had people who own these units, most of the different PEMF units, I've had a chance to test them. And they bring them to my, my laboratory and I'll test them. And they're usually overstated by a factor of 10 to 100. And it's common knowledge among people who make PEMF systems that, that the entire marketing surrounding PEMF is pretty much just a big lie. Okay. So even if I could tell you that number, which I can, most of these PEMF companies can't because they can't measure it and they can't calculate it. Uh, but let's just say I tell you a number 42. What are you going to do with that? Well, here is the problem. Let me show you the problem. Let's say I put some cells in there, right? We'll just call this little guy a cell. Yippee, yippee. And I put a bunch of them in there. So now I have a magnetic field running through cells, big clump of cells. Hooray, and my magnetic field is 42. What's it going to do? The answer is, I don't know. Nobody knows. It's not been published. It hasn't been characterized. Nobody knows exactly how magnetic flux affects living tissue. So even if you had a, a number for the magnetic field, it wouldn't tell you what's happening. The closest you can come is something that I've published, I guess, 150 or 200 times now, which is it's not the magnetic field. It's how quickly the magnetic field changes. And with the magnetic field changing, the rate at which you change the magnetic field is directly proportional to the induced electric field. And that is what seems to be having a biological effect. That's why DC steady magnets, that's why you can't just replace a PEMF system with just a solid magnet because a solid magnet's not changing quickly enough. It doesn't change at all. So here's the problem. We don't know how exactly the molecular mechanism that's causing cells to respond to changes in magnetic fields. We just don't know that. Anybody who tells you they know that is either a lot smarter than me, which, I, you know, it's possible. It could be Mark, right? Or, or they're lying, which they could be, say, a politician, for example. It's going to be one of those two things. But um, we don't know. So, so, like, does that mean we can't do anything or can't say anything? Well, how about light? Let's go back to light. Say you turn on a light in a room. And you'll know right away, try to read a book. Is it too bright or is it too dark? Do you need more illumination or less illumination? Well, you could, if you happen to have a light meter, if you're a hardcore photographer, you could go in there, you could measure the illumination, you could measure you know, the, the color temperature, you can measure these things. But in the final analysis, what matters is, is it comfortable for you to read, right? What really matters is, not that you're measuring the light intensity, but you you take into account your own optical physiology and everything, the, the, the contrast of the letters in the book. And yeah, is this enough light or not? So you don't need a number. Oh, it's 1400 lux. You know, so that's, that's good for me to read. You don't know if it's going to be too much or not enough. <coughs> Excuse me. I must have COVID or something. So what do you do? 
you can change the number of lights in your room, rearrange the lighting, change where you're located, change the light bulbs. None of these require you to take a measurement of the light. And I, I submit to you <coughs> that PEMF is the same way. That what you really need to do is get a system that you can reliably say, okay, this is built by reputable people. They've spent a lot of time testing this in biological systems. So if you test it on yourself and it doesn't seem to be doing anything, then you can, there's ways to change the intensity, change the way it's set up, right? More important than intensity probably is the direction of the magnetic flux lines. So that's the answer that I'm going to give to this question, which is, you know, what's the magnetic field around the coils? The answer is you don't really need to know. You don't really need to know the intensity of the light in your house. You don't really need to know the thermodynamics of gas burning in your gasoline engine in your car. You simply need to know that it works and you need to know the basics about how to turn it on and off and how to use it. And that's my answer. And, and, and we started off with this. It's a little bit boring, I know, but I get asked this question almost every day. This is actually today. It's the third time I've answered this question. I'm not frustrated by it because this is a really difficult topic. And you hear the same pseudo answer coming from all these PEMF marketers telling you, oh, you need to know this number and that number, and they throw these pseudo scientific terms. But the answer is, you can't really measure it. You can't really verify it. You don't really know. We don't know how it affects cells. So you just have to get a good PEMF system and try it and then adjust it until you see a biological effect. Just like you would adjust the light next to your reading chair, same deal. So there it is. Okay. Okay, we actually got another question. All right. And uh, I can read it. Stop. It says, um, can the brain gauge determine if beer is good for the brain? And by good, I'm quoting here, by good, I mean it will make you less stressed, more relaxed, which will reduce heart attacks. In other words, can the brain gauge determine levels of stress? And if so, or if not, why and how? This is obviously written by somebody with a professorial background because they keep asking why and how and if so and why not. But let's answer the first question. <laughs> Can the brain gauge look at the impact of alcohol? And we've done this, you know, we've done this study many times. I volunteered back in the, when we had the very first prototype. And uh, I have an answer for this, too. I, I, I tried it. If you can't operate the brain gauge, then you had too much to drink. <laughs> that's a possibility but when you first drink you know the really interesting thing was because uh alcohol has what are called GABA agonists in them that improves in a person just slightly and it does reduce stress a little bit but you know with one or two drinks sometimes you actually improve performance but you know we've actually talked about this before now what happens after that is people start getting a difference in self-perception a difference in how good they are. And, uh, you know, they start thinking, oh, I'm, I'm actually really, really sharp when I drink. And actually, as you drink more and more, your, your scores will go get worse and worse. It's sort of like, it's sort of like Bob's friend who said, oh yeah, I know I lift weights better. I am better at lifting weight when I, uh, when I drink and I actually got to measure it though. But some of the scores are actually very uh, sensitive to stress. And if you look at them, you can actually see if long term, let's say you, you drink uh, one drink a day for a couple of weeks, you could actually see if that actually reduces your or improves some of your scores on a long term scale. But, you know, the whole idea of self-perception where you say, I do so much better when I drink and like I can lift more weight when I drink. And uh, I love that story of yours. You know, you've had that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's retell the story for the live audience, right? I had a friend in high school who was convinced that he was stronger after he had a few beers. So I said, okay. And we set up my bench press and we, we got a one rep maximum and we waited a few minutes, had him have, drink a beer, did another one, did another. It, after his first beer, it went straight down. He <laughs> lost like half of his strength. But his perception was that he was stronger. Yeah. And so that's that always leads into the question of self-perception that, you know, basically it's it just blows us away whenever you talk to some people. They they're why would I need a brain gauge to to see if I how my brain's doing? And well, this is a really important point, right, because I just told people the best way to tell whether or not PMF is working for them 
is do they, you know, try to quantify, I mean, is your pain getting better or worse, but it's really it's perception. But here I'm asking people to use their brain to measure an effect on their body, right? Is right. the pain going down? Is the swelling going down? That Sometimes you can measure that with a, with a tape, right? Or by plethysma graph, you know, you can actually measure swelling. But in the case where you're doing something to your brain, your brain is a very poor tool to measure the effect on itself. Right. And that's the real difference here. So what I'm saying is, is don't worry about adjusting knobs to get a certain number on, on a magnetic field if you're treating your leg, you know, or your or your or a bruise or something like that or a broken bone. There you really want to go by how it feels. But if you're doing something with your brain, you you actually have to take an you actually have to take a measurement that's you know that's that's objective, which means it needs to be measured by something other than your brain. Okay, uh, I have another question. This is I have Bob. lots of questions. Yeah, this is for you, Bob. You might oh. have to uh, get your aquarium out to answer this. Would PEMF be enhanced if one does a treatment underwater? That's a really cool question. Let me tell you why. Because part of it is we don't know. If there's a water immersion effect on the tissues, we really don't know if that there would be an effect there because I don't think anybody studied it. Uh, Mark and I have done a little bit about uh, soaking seeds for plants mm -hmm. and applying PEMF to them. And there does seem to be a little bit of an effect. I haven't quantified it yet. So, and they're done in water. All right. But it may be that it's the soaking, activating the seed, turning things on. And if you add to that PEMF, you get more activation of a seed getting ready to germinate. We know yeah. there's about a 15, 10 or 15% 15, 15 increase in germination rate, at least for, for easily germinating cells and then for, for of seeds. And those that don't germinate so easily, there's an even bigger change. But all yeah, of that notwithstanding. Or, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a really good question. Talking about segueing to plants. I know as soon as you mentioned plants, a lot of people ignore it and say, oh, plants don't count. Well, we the, the thing is they're living organisms, right? Yeah. So, so, and not all seeds are really just seeds. Some of them are little encapsulated plants, like, you know, mung beans, bean beans in general, right? So, yeah, but they have the same cell structure. I mean, basically, except. And they have, have cell wall proteins, stuff. things like I think what's really involved in this are G proteins, these transmembrane proteins that uh, many of them are known. There's, there's something like 800 different G proteins that are known, but many of them seem to be sensitive to electromagnetism but it's not known what their function is. So I think there's, there's a lot of candidates for what could be the mechanism for magnetic. You know, and one of the things that we specialize in is getting off topic. Well, we never really right. had a topic, but well, no, let's, let's get right. Let's snap right back on and say, you know, the thing is that the extent to which the water interacts with, uh, you say to immerse an organism or part of an organ, arm or leg in water, the extent to which it, they interact with, with the addition of a magnetic field is kind of unknown. But you can say, well, okay, does it affect the physics of the magnetic field itself per se? And that's a very different thing, right? So is the magnetic field enhanced underwater or is it uh, reduced underwater? And I would say that it depends on the conductivity of the water, right? I mean, it's magnetic permeability is pretty good. But for a steady field, it's not likely to change the magnetic field much. But if you change the field quickly, that will induce an electric eddy current and that will suck away energy from the magnetic field. Okay, the eddy current is doing work by making an eddy current. That's how electric brakes work on electric brakes on trucks and trains, right? They can be quite powerful. So yeah. if your water is conductive, so if the water is salt water, I would anticipate that a rapidly changing magnetic field would be attenuated as it tries to pass through salt water. And that's what's happening in your body, right? Because you've got normal saline level, you know, so you, there is some loss in the magnetic field, but that's because it's doing work on the ions in the water. If it's pure distilled water, I think the effect would be less. And that's mm -hmm. just the interaction of the magnetic field of water. That's totally separate from biological effects. So yeah. I would say. But while we're, while we're getting off topic, let's go back to the plants. Can you briefly go over the, the results that you got on the, on the, plant germination stuff. 
Well, week. yeah, we, I looked at some, uh, you know, um, uh, I looked at a few different plants. I'm, I'm going to start another set maybe in a day or two, but I uh, looked at um, uh, lettuce and looked at um, pepper plants and looked at the main ones I looked at so far are bell peppers, lettuce, which germinates very well, bell peppers, which germinate maybe more like 35 or 40%, whereas lettuce was more like 85% of the seeds will germinate. Um, pepper was more like 35 or 40%. And then I looked at strawberries, which have a very low germination rate. It's, it's just a few percent. So when you buy strawberry seeds, you might get 5,000 seeds and you might end up with a dozen or two dozen strawberry plants. So I think it's down below 1%. But in all three cases, I mean, I, I planted, I told you this, what was it? 9,000 seeds. And I checked to see when they germinated, how long and everything. Yeah. And I did it under different electromagnetic, uh, you know, pulsatile, um, uh, you know, interventions. That scientific question was, you know, does it need to be a longer period of time or shorter? It turns out you seem to get a lot of an effect as long as you're doing it for at least 15 or 20 minutes up to maybe two hours. You get this maximum pro germination effect. And seeds that were normally germinating at about 85% started germinating more like 95% of the time. Uh, the uh, pepper seeds went from maybe 30 or 40% germination up to, and we're going to publish this in our journal, by the way, Josan, Journal of Science and Medicine. The pepper plants, uh, they got way out of control. I ended up having to give a bunch of them to Mark because I didn't have room for them. And I, I didn't yeah, expect many. A lot of peppers. <laughs> I didn't expect many pepper plants. I expected to end up with maybe a hundred and I ended up getting, you know, hundreds of them, several hundred of them. And, um, oh gosh, many, many. And you could literally see the difference where there had been no, no electric stimulation or just a little bit, but not enough to help. It's like a, like a reversed, you know, uh, effect where um, it's like a reverse hormesis where a little bit actually had a negative effect. So if you just did it for a minute or two, it was a reduction in the in the germination. But if you did it for a good 10 or 15 minutes, you started to see an increase and, and each tray was done differently. And then I mixed them up and everything. So you couldn't, uh, I didn't know which ones were which, but when, when I went through the key, you could definitely see some plants, some trays were just overflowing, you know, using the same light conditions, the same humidity, the same amount of water and everything. Some were, were overflowing with plants and some just had a little bit of germination here and there. And it plots almost perfectly, like you can put a curve right through the points. So it's not like it was a big scatter. It was definitely a, it was definitely a transfer function of the exposure of the magnetic field to the germination rate for the plants I've tested so far. So the ones we're, gonna, we're going to test starting maybe tomorrow or, or this weekend are going to be uh, seedless watermelons, tomatoes, a few other things. Yeah, seedless watermelons are really hard. Those seeds, which is sounds weird, but there are seeds for seedless watermelons, but they're really hard to germinate. Yes. I mean, I've had terrible luck with those. That's uh, correct. And so I got, a, I got enough of those to do an experiment. It took me, what, three months to get some, but I got a pretty nice little set of seedless watermelons uh, just a couple weeks ago, seedless watermelon seeds. So the question is, is there an effect of PEMF on seedless watermelon? So we'll do that. And then we'll, we'll end up, once I've collected that data, we'll publish all of it. You can, you can see it. But basically, um, the, uh, the upshot is there seems to be an effect on plants with PEMF. And there seems to be an effect whether or not you're soaking them when you, when you stimulate the seeds, which is the basic question is, is the effect of PEMF enhanced underwater? And I think it is for plants, but I think it's indirect. I think it's the water is starting to activate the plant. And then the PEMF activates the plant and you get the synergistic effect, right? Whereas um, like if you put somebody's arm or leg underwater, would it help? And I think the answer is no, it probably would not enhance the effect, at least not directly because the water is likely to be somewhat impure, which means it's dissipating some of the magnetic energy before it even gets to you. That's my answer. Cool. Uh, another non-quick question, or it could be quick, uh, depending on how you answer it. Uh, a viewer said they were talking to a friend from Russia about PMF, mentioned they thought they had it in Russia, and they, their response was they use it in medical clinics there all the time. 
And this person asked, how can we use the information that they have collected in Russia to guide the use of PMF peer? So, well, that's an excellent question. I was going to pull out the book, which I normally have sitting right here, um, but I can't see it right now. So it's usually within a couple of feet of me. Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> oh, can't see it. Okay, there's a book here that if I turn it, it won't disappear. It's disappearing. Magnetic, it's called it's a Magic Book Magnetic Therapy in Eastern Europe, a review of 30 years of research by Bill Pollack, who's a friend of ours, and uh, Jerry Jerabek, MD, PhD. And they go through the physics of PEMF as discovered and described by Eastern Bloc researchers during the Cold War. So what happened was this, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the Russians and Eastern Bloc, there were some other countries like Romania and other, you know, East Germany and places like that, where they did a huge amount of PEMF research. And if you wanna read about it, um, it's all factored into books by um, Bill Pollack because he did a huge review of it in 1998 in his book. Um, the book itself is like $45. And it's a really tough read and there's a lot of physics, but basically what was interesting, what happened. And one of the things that should make you more confident about PEMF is that during the late fifties, then sixties, seventies, and eighties, there's a lot of research behind the iron curtain, but none of it really was shared with the West. It was sort of treated almost like a state secret. Meanwhile, here in, in the United States and, and Japan, Canada and other places that were not in the free world, we did our research and we got the same answers and there was no cross pollination between the two. But it turns out that the Russians did a lot of good work and that's kind of been factored into, you know, when the wall fell and a lot of this information became available, you can find a lot of these papers now in PubMed searches. And, um, but a lot of it hasn't been tra translated, but a lot of it has. So it's kind of factored into the research. It's stuff that, that those of us who actually research this know. I don't think the Russians knew any great deep secrets about this. They simply kept running tests and finding effects, just like we do. We run a test and we see a biological effect and we, we publish it. And they tested about eh, 30 different disease states. They tried everything from high blood pressure to various cancers to orthopedic injury and stuff like that. And they found that, you know, sometimes it helps a lot. And sometimes it helps sometimes. And sometimes it doesn't seem to help at all. And basically the same things we found, right? And so I would say the thing to take away from this, from, from the Russian research in 30 years, is that the Russians, because they didn't have a society based so much on fraudulent marketing, sort of like we do here in the United States, theirs is a little bit more based on, their science is a little bit more based on science. At least it was when I was stuff I was reading. And basically it, um, it says what I've been saying all along, which is the rate at which you change the magnetic field induces an electric field. And if you test it, it has effects on a wide range of diseases that don't seem to be related. Why should something help fix a broken bone, but also help with prostate cancer, but also help with peripheral neural nerve disease? Why should one thing do all that stuff? The answer, the more recent modern answer in the last 20 years seems to be what it's really doing is suppressing pathologic inflammation. We don't know how, we don't know why. It's different than the kind of inflammation that's suppressed by aspirin because otherwise aspirin would already do all these things, but it doesn't. But that seems to be what PMF is doing. But there's no, I can tell you, there's no deep secret buried in the Russian literature and I don't think there's much risk that we've overlooked something. It's, they pretty much did the same thing we did. About 500 to maybe 1,000 observations that basically say, yep, this works. Cool. A um, couple, I think we got time for a couple more quick questions. Uh, this is a follow-up to what you were, we were just talking about, the plants and germination, is when do you place the coils by the seeds? Is a question wow. about the germinations. When or what's the logistics of putting the coils put around a little seat. plastic yeah. shot glass. I put them into yeah. a little plastic one ounce shot glass, add some water, let them soak for a certain amount of time that they're supposed to soak for. And I put the coil rings around them to put it on alpha wave or, or about, I actually set it to 15 pulses per second. 
turn it on like a medium intensity and let it run for 15 minutes to two hours, whatever you want. Right. Well, you might want to mention there's a tuning curve for that. And well, there is, and we'll publish that. Too much is bad, and we'll publish it, but it's, you know, too much is bad. and Too much is bad. Work. If you go more than about five hours, you start to get lower germination rates. If you go yeah. less than about five minutes, you get lower germination rates. So if you look at the germination rate, it starts off, oop, I just lost my hand. It starts off at a certain level. You add a little bit of PEMF and it goes down, but then it goes up again and it stays up for stimulating somewhere between five or 10 minutes to maybe two or three hours. But then after two or three hours, it seems to be too much. Right. This is another thing I keep telling people, you know, sometimes with PEMF, it's like anything else, too much is too much. You right. Don't it's sort of, it's sort of like people taking uh, supplements or, or nootropics. They just, uh, they think more is always better, but that's oh, gonna be a super genius. hardly the case. Uh, here's an interesting question, or it's not a question. It's, a, well, yeah, it is a question. Uh, my cat is 16 and she is still doing very well. Thanks to ISIS that gave us both new life. She loves it. Is PEMF addictive? No, this, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's addictive and I don't think it's habit forming. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's habituation either. So I, I've been using it for about seven years. I only use it to suppress pain in my lower back, really. It works. I'm wearing one right now. So the question is, first of all, is there habituation? Does your body need more and more like a drug in order to get the same effect? And the answer is no. It seems like the more you use it, the more that you're facilitating a healing process, the less you need. So I keep dialing mine down year after year and use less and less and less intensity. So it doesn't habituate you. Now, is it habit forming? Well, I'll tell you this. It depends on what you define as habit forming. Um, a person who's treated, several people who've treated, they're equine action, acupuncturists who use acupuncture to treat horses. Horses get terrible injuries. I didn't realize this until I started working with them. But apparently horses can get all kinds of terrible injuries. They get this inflammation. Then they can be in horrible, horrible pain. And they become very unmanageable animals. But if you treat them with PEMF, this happens with, with horses, dogs, and, and humans, and the pain goes away, then it's really interesting. If that horse sees the same person, if that horse that was kicking at people and biting them and pushing people away from sees the person with a PEMF coming again, they calm down and they walk up to that person completely calmly. That's what's really, and I've had, I've had probably four, maybe five equine acupuncturists tell me that. Now what that is, is that an addiction? I mean, it depends on how you define addiction. If addiction means that you look forward to another treatment that makes your pain go away, then that's an addiction. If it's simply um, a very positive uh, uh, response, <laughs> right? If it's, operant, if it's operant conditioning to say, if you put, you know, there's a difference between addiction and, and operant conditioning. Yeah, right? I don't know if there's any operant conditioning associated with it. But well, yeah, if their horse sees that person and once that person gets close, then the pain goes away. True. I mean, addiction is an interesting question because addiction is usually related to pleasure rather than just removal of absence of pain. As a person who's there suffered. Is, there, those are actually separate pathways. I totally, but I can tell you as a person who has suffered chronic pain for a lot of his adult life, there is nothing more pleasurable than a day without pain. Nothing absolutely nothing and you look forward to it if you can possibly achieve it especially if you don't have to pay for it in spades the next day so you will do the reason for the opioid epidemic i think as much as as much as physiologic addiction by that pathway which i think is real and i think you're right mark i mean i know you're right because that's what literature yeah. is. there is the other thing where opioids don't give you any kind of long-term relief which means you have to keep right. coming back to that it's sort of like saying, is food addicting? You know, right. yes and no, right? I mean, you got to keep going back if you want to live. But on the other hand, I mean, there's pleasure pathways associated too. So I, you know, is it addicting in the in a bad way? I don't think PEMF is addictive. Um, if you define an addictive behavior as one that's self-destructive or destructive to the community or those around you, then PEMF is definitely not addictive. Because I don't know of any cases where somebody using PEMF it has resulted in them selling their television set to get. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You never know. Well, I, I think that's, uh, I, 
did like the cat question. Uh, one of the things I was going to ask to, uh, or just get you to mention, is that uh, Bob, you recently uh, we re recently published a paper on on cat renal failure, and that's uh, yeah. Journal of Science and Medicine. So that's a case study, and so we encourage people if they want to write, if they have data, if they have like lab results on on their pets that they used, and if they want to write it up. Uh, it's basically what Bob did. You, you helped your brother write up a paper on effects of ISIS on his cat. Right, exactly. And I mean, just, I'll just, uh, I'll just splash it up there for you, for all to see. Um, here, here it comes. Um, the, uh, here it comes, I hope. Um, maybe I should have pulled it up on Josem, but here it is. Okay, so. Um, what my brother did was he had, he was struggling with his cat having a uh, feline kidney disease. And, um, what he did, all he did was, let me just, uh, I'll pull this up and then I'll show you. All he did was he, uh, let's see here, share screen. There we go. Okay. So can everybody see that? There's a cat, his kidneys are on the back, and my brother just took an A9 and put the coils over the kidneys twice a week for about half an hour, twice a week, maybe 20 minutes, twice a week. And the result was um, this graph that it took him about four and a half years to give me the data for this graph. And so uh, the vertical axis here is, um, is creatinine level, the higher the worse. And you want a normal creatinine level usually for a cat would be below about 1.6. And you can see the red bars and green bars here shows you when he's using uh, ICES. Red bars, the creatinine goes up and the cat has you know, re renal failure. He uses ICES PMF and it comes down. And then he stops using it, goes up, starts using it, comes down. Progressively started using it less and less, progressively it went up. And then he started using it again permanently and came down finally to the normal range after four and a half years. But if he had kept up with it from the very beginning, it looks like the cat might have come into the normal range in about a year, maybe less. So the point being that this is one cat. What can you say about an N of one experiment? Well, Mark and I have talked about that extensively, right, Mark? And so we invite people to go ahead and, and rerun this experiment with their cats. Almost every cat owner that I know either themselves or one of their friends has a cat with, with feline kidney kidney disease. Yeah. So I don't know if you mentioned this, but, but those, those levels, uh, basically if this cat had been untreated, they probably would have died. Yeah. When it gets to about five, yeah. and that yeah. level gets up to about five. That's, that's called not renal, um, failure. Yeah. That's, that's kidney failure. And that's yeah. when the animal is in terrible, terrible distress and, and they, basically they die. So this animal, we think, was had been suffering for, for months, and uh, it was a rescue, my brother did. And then uh, by using ICES, so yeah, the cat loves to jump in his lap and loves to sit there quietly while he's using the rings on it. And, and then it's not just, you know, creatinine, right, which is a number you can measure, which is the clinical metric for, for kidney function of the cat. He said, but the cat also has a lot less pain and, and discomfort. It, can, now it can sleep on hard surfaces, cold surfaces, in a way that it couldn't when it was going through all this problem. So it's not just kidney function, but it's a lot of things related to the cat's well-being. So there we go. I'll stop share here. We've, yeah. we've, probably, we've probably made everybody suffer enough. So, you know, this is probably long for almost an hour. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> well, we, we bumbled around for a few minutes there. So, so it's probably been about 40 to 50 minutes, but yeah, that's good enough. If you guys have any, uh, if the audience has any more questions, they can always continue. Or in the future, if you got, I think we'd like to interview some people. If they've got suggestions for who they'd like to enter interviews from, or if they think they're worth listening to, we, we have them on. The only thing you got to be prepared for is that Mark and I abuse people. Uh, we yeah. abuse each other. <laughs> And there's kind of no holes barred, and that's kind of the way it is. So, yeah, yeah we'll try. This is our first little toe in the water here, and if this works out pretty well, we'll probably invite you know a few people who to come on and talk to us about these things.
Okay. Right. So until next time, we'll, uh, you know, put yourself on the email list if you want to get updates or, uh, or, or block your emails if you don't want to get updates. So whatever, if you want to find out when we're on next, we'll uh, shoot an email and, and take uh, questions in advance or topics in advance, whatever, whatever suits you. So excellent. It's been, in. It's, it's time to go harvest potatoes. So that's right. Okay. <laughs> it's been fun. Well, um, thanks a lot. You bet. Talk to you later.